thanks everybody for turning up. There's some uh, good familiar faces here and some new ones. I hope um, everybody feels like they're going to learn something from tonight. Um, for those that don't know me and, um, and Rob, um, we work for a company called TRG. We're an agile focused recruitment business. Um, we set up the Agile Roundabout to try and get something back to the community and um, we've been working in and about it for a very long time. So um, it's been great, we've met some really interesting people um, and we hope the talks are really, really interesting. Um, tonight we've got Michael Frank from Just Giving um, doing a talk on data-driven development and um, also we've got um, Dan Klein here from Valtech um, doing a talk on when information is relevant. Um, we did have a third speaker, but they um, canned us for a web summit in Portugal, um, which is our first dropout from the speaking perspective. Um, so we've had a bad hit rate so far, but um, although it's a little disappointing, we uh, we hope that there's some, some really good content to, uh, to to excite you all tonight on a, on a cold November evening. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to pass over. If anybody, also sorry, this is something I didn't say in the last one. If anybody um, uses Twitter. Can they tweet using the Twitter handle Agile Roundabout? Um, that would be great. We're just trying to get um, more of a buzz going about the whole thing. Um, so yeah. And uh, JG Hackers. Or and JG Hackers for just giving. Yeah. Great. And thanks to Anna. Is Anna here? No. Okay. Cool. Pass you over to Mike. Thanks. Hey everyone, welcome to the Giving Office. So today's topic for me is data-driven development, which is kind of similar to domain-driven design, and this is basically just for a pun we did, kind of. So my name is Michal, you can pronounce it Michael, so I'm from Poland, that's why it's Michal. And I'm a lead developer at Giving, which basically means I'm an Outlook machine right now, which is like I was programming, and now I'm kind of using Outlook and programming Outlook mostly. And you can find more information about me on my blog, or you can follow me on Twitter, and also we can get some nice conversations on Twitter, like that. And what I'm going to talk today is how to improve the teamwork in our teams, and why, and how we can do this using data. But that's the main topic of this, of this talk. So when we do product development, it's kind of simple process, a bit. We kind of have a brilliant idea, then we kind of implement it, which is like, do engineering stuff, we deploy it to production. Then we have to market it, which is like we have to tell people that actually we have the new product, new feature, it's available. Because there might be people that actually are in need, but they still might not be aware that we are actually fulfilling their need. So we have to market it. And then of course we will profit. So it looks simple, but there is one catch to this whole idea, to this whole simple product development. And this catch is like, how do we recognize brilliant ideas really, how do we find the great idea that will make our product really better and awesome and super great. So it's like a problem like this, when we have like a, a lot of belts and most of like, imagine those belts are like ideas or some things you would like to do. Most of them are not really brilliant and it's really difficult to recognize the ones that are really important and the ones that will drive our products to go really to like a higher degree or to better market share or will enable us to find and reach our goals. So the question is how do you find them? And it's the, the road to find them is not that really simple. It's not like simple like here where we have only one simple road, clear vision, clear goal, and it's like you just go somewhere and yeah, we have a brilliant idea. But it's much more complicated normally and it has like a you know, it's hilly terrain, uh, curves and you can even fall off the hill and go somewhere and even hurt yourself. And most of the time, we have multiple of different ideas, multiple of different <coughs> things that we would like to do, and we are faced with like a decision to think here, like, we have to decide, should we go here or, or here, right? So most of the time, it always comes kind of like a down to decision, so we have to make the decisions. We kind of brainstorm the ideas, we kind of brainstorm the features, and then we have to find out which ones are the really great ones, the suitable ones. So, just to go somewhere, like, how do we make decisions? Like how this process works? So for this, we use this machine, which is Brain. This is really brilliant and great machine. And yeah, a little noise right now. It's like a metro going through. Yeah. So we use we use the Brain. This is our machine to make decisions. And it's a great machine. We are very proud of it. Everyone's proud of it. Of our own brains, really. And scientists are even trying to recreate it, like create artificial one, which will help us 
fix some problems. <laughs> but there are, there are some problems with it. Like, even with this awesome device, we still have problems making the dinner. And there are two problems with it. One of them is that brain is not a specialized device. Brain is used for different other things. So brain is used for maintaining my biology, maintaining my chemistry in the body, maintaining my ego, psyche, and every other thing. So it's not a specialized device. The other thing about brain is that brain is like an evolving neural network. So in order to make brain better and enable our brain to make better decisions, we need to acquire experience and we need to acquire knowledge that will generate this small or big neural network in our brain. So, I think that we need help. Using even this awesome device that we have here, which is really important and great and it's really, really super great in solving different kinds of issues, still, when making decisions, we need some help. And this is where I think we, this help will be data. And with data, the other help will be also collective intelligence, which is like instead of using one brain to solve problems and one brain to make decisions, like let's use like multiple people, like collective, working on the same solution, the same problem, fixing the same problem. Okay, so putting the decision making process in like, oh, sorry, I have a little dot here. I'm using browser and I have to plug it that sometimes shows shared image back to this. So if we put like a decision making process in a simple equa equation with like a little chart in here when, when we have one decision on the left side and the best kind of decision on the right side. If we base our decisions only on luck, we kind of will end up kind of here. So it's not really even a okay decision, it's kind of between words and somehow some some really not good decision. And even the, the reason it's not like fully distributed around here is that our luck based decision it still has our own point of view. So I'm still gonna have even if I make a decision, I have a couple of different options, and those options I'm going to select, I'm going to pick up. They are going to be based on my point of view, my experience, my knowledge. That's why the life is not fully distributed. Because if I don't have experience and knowledge, and I'm developing business to consumer products, I might think about, okay, if I eat banana, will it, give me, will it make a better product for me? Well, obviously, it won't do this, right? So that's why if it's based only on life, it's kind of be here. Okay. So like I mentioned before, in order to improve our brain possibilities, we need to have experience. And with experience, the decision-making process is getting better. And then with knowledge, the decision-making process is also getting better, kind of somehow getting close to the okay position. But we still can get further. We can still get further to the best one. And how to do this? So this is where I think we can add some unknown variable, like here, because luck is undeterministic. It's really randomized. The same with experience. It's depends on people, it depends on everyone else. Everyone else will have different experience. And the same with knowledge. Everyone else will have different knowledge that they can use, they can, uh, you can use to make decisions. So this X, this X, in my opinion, we can replace with data. And I, as you can see, if we, if we use some data to drive our randomized process, this, this chart in the below gets closer to the best solution. The same with experience. With more data, we can get more relevant, important experience. And the same with knowledge. With more data, we can get more better knowledge together. So we are, with this process, we are kind of getting close to the best decision. But it's still, this one still gives us like a kind of good decision. So how do we <coughs> even great, best, awesome, super great decision? Well, this is where I think uh, something else I mentioned before kicks in. And it's like a, if you take a team that is able to do good decisions and you bring everyone together, you get really closer to the best one. And this is something we call kind of collective intelligence. People working together on solving dif different problems. At the break. Okay, so this is a brief introduction why I think data is helpful in our decision making process and why data is helpful in our product development. Now, the question is how to use this data and how we collect the data and things like that. So, this is where I'm going to introduce you to something we call data driven development, and this is the main topic of the presentation. <coughs> and we kind of started doing it in just giving in one team, now we are trying to push it over to different teams. But just to tell you what we just giving, uh, just a little, little introduction to our company. So, we are a social giving platform, we have millions of users, and we are supporting people and causes around the world which is like if there is someone in need, we kind of try to help them and find a person that wants to help this, this person. We kind of connect those people together. And we so far raised $3 billion. Maybe this number is a bit bigger right now. 
Yeah. So those numbers are mostly here to show you that there is, a, there is some scope behind our product. So we get some data. We get a lot of data. And we have different products, funding, <coughs> funding campaigns. There are more products, not only those few, but those few are the biggest ones. And on this presentation, I want to focus on crowdfunding because this is the product I'm currently working on, and this is the product when we started the data-driven development process. And crowdfunding is like a product that enables you to give money to your friends. So it's not like you give money to charity, you give money straight to the friends. And this is like, uh, this is crowdfunding. So, in crowdfunding and across the just giving, we are collecting a lot of data. And this is mostly things like actions on the website, just like which button person click, what did they do, how they uh, entered the page, how they exited the page, how many pages they shared, how they shared, which buttons they clicked to share, uh, clicks, all the clicks on the platform. And we also run a lot of A-B tests, which is like we have version A, B, we check how people are interacting with the product and then deciding which one is the better one. And to do this, we kind of use our own customized data collection platform, which I'm not going into details here because it will take us another 30 minutes really to explain it. But we use tools like Hadoop, uh, Tableau, Amazon, Kissmetrics, Kinesis, and all the different tools here. So this is like uh, our internal data collection system. And we also use external tools to collect the data. So we have a lot of different integrations that also are giving us a lot of data which are mostly like things like Wallaroos and there's Conservative Monkey, which are mostly, those are mostly consumer based, which is like we ask the consumers what they think about the platform, or Wallaroo is for instance for NPS, so we also ask the consumers what's the NPS, which is like net promoter score, it's just like basically a score how people like our product. And then that is for like a communication with the issues. We also use Google Analytics, which is something I like to call small data solutions, because this is mostly used by our business to to write some of the decisions and some of the analytics, while most of the stuff is based on our solution. We also use Hotjar, which is like a tool to spy on people, which tells you where people kind of look, look at what place in your platform, or how they interact with the product, which is like basically tracking every movement, every click, every mouse movement, and things like that. And we also use for our B2B consumers, we use uh, Salesforce, Exact Target, Marketo, which is like the big uh, solution here. So, all of this, all of those tools, all of those mechanisms, they generate a lot of big data, which is like a high port right now. And it's so high being right now that I was at some other conference two weeks ago, and I asked some students on the London School of Economics. Okay, basically they asked me, where do I work? So I told them I work in IT, I'm an engineer. And they uh, asked me, oh, okay, so you're doing big data. So right now for the students in London, IT engineering is like a synonym to big data, which is kind of confusing to me because data is like a subset of something different. So big data is really hyping a lot. And yesterday, if you follow something called technology radar from Totworks, Totworks even noticed a little problem in there, and they put in big data uh, entity, like a term, but on a hold something, on a hold position, which, which means that a lot of companies are investing a lot of money into big data, but no one really knows how to use it. And this is really a big problem, because collecting data is kind of easy. You just create and post, get the data, and you just store it somewhere. But then finding a way on how to use this data, this is the bigger, biggest problem. And this is like something I'm going to try to say in later, in later uh, slides. So the way we approach it is that instead of thinking about data like a single, single metrics in here, like we have some metrics in here, like data, so simple, single handedly. Uh, collected data, we kind of aggregate them and create special abstractions, which are based on a common language. So in the, instead of thinking about metrics and data in like a one single word or one single data like uh, click share or, lit, or click on a platform, we kind of create, collect more of them and create abstractions from them, which removes complexity and kind of exposes simplicity and understanding. So all those abstractions are kind of, I'm going to show you some examples. All those abstractions are trying to make this difficult metrics and kind of aggregating them together. Do we have some equa equations that are basically taking those and creating like a one big metric that explains something a lot better in a better way? So we call those levers because this is like a, a nice uh, synonym to like thing that you can just move one way or another. And this also gives other people the idea that, hey, actually we can change those metrics. We can, we can manipulate them to kind of give us some benefits, some reach some goals. 
And some examples of those levels of abstraction. Like if we take like the number of shares we have and share conversion and share exposure, we can kind of call it virality. And it means like if you take those single handedly and you think about number of shares, it kind of gives you some indication that something is happening. But if you aggregate it with share conversion and share exposure, you can get something really <coughs> better, which is called like a virality here. And virality is like a nice word to even communicate with people that are not really close to business. Even developers, which are, might not understand like the uh, concept of sharing and why shares on the platform are important, if you tell them virality, it's like a virus it's spreading. So it's really something that they can kind of attach to and they can really e more easily understand. And then you can, like I mentioned, level, you can manipulate it. You can make virality smaller or bigger if you, if you want to make it smaller. Really. Another example. If you take like a time spent on a page, and then user activity, and then number of shares, and number of likes, and number of comments, like single-handedly, those metrics are telling you something, but if you aggregate them together and put them into one metric called user engagement, this gives you a better idea of what is happening, and why those metrics are affecting, and how they are affecting the product, why they are important. And, and as, as, as with the previous example, you can make user engagement smaller, or or bigger. So we kind of use this this approach, and what's important in the dignity good abstractions is that they have to be easy to understand. So you have to pick the words. It's like if you are familiar with domain-driven design, there is a concept of ubiquitous language, which is kind of like a language that is used between different people in a in a team, uh, business developers using the same language to communicate together. So this is the same thing here. You are, you are creating a really good abstraction that are aggregating the data and have a nice naming to kind of influence the way people communicate with the team. And it has to be close to the core of the business because you have to really create abstractions and you have to follow the metrics that are really important to your business, that are driving your business. And they have to be based on, a mission, on your mission, uh, mission, mission, sorry, what that? Yeah, that's a like clear signal, I just want that. So those abstractions, they also have to be based on the mission and goal, mission and goal, because this is linked to the core of the business. They have to be really, you have to be focused, and those abstractions have to be focused on what we want to achieve. And to go further and show you what kind of levels we are using at Just Giving and crowdfunding product, I have to explain you, like, because this has to be close to mission and goal, I have to explain you briefly what's the mission of crowdfunding and Just Giving as a whole. So our mission is basically, we want to ensure that there are no good causes that go from funded. Which is basically, like I mentioned, we kind of find people which are in need <coughs> and find people which are really wanting to give something back to the community and we kind of create connection between them. Yeah. So this is this is basically our mission. I put in the so East Pacific here because this is the most important part of the world nowadays. Uh, okay, so this mission, which is like in here, it leads to it leads to our goal. So we translate this mission to our goal. So how can we achieve this mission? Well, so we kind of concluded that to achieve this mission and enable and find people that are in need and people that want to give and connect them, we kind of we should increase the number of donations that last one. This will be like a nice indication of what is happening. We should also increase the number of givers, which is like find those people that uh, want to give back. And we should build awareness and community, which is like we should show people in need that we are actually here and we can help them because you will be surprised on how many people are there that are really in like a bad situation with their life and they don't even know that they could get help from someone or they could find uh, help someone in some organization or in product by job giving. And building community is also important because we want to teach people how to crowdfund and how to collect money really in a good uh, way which is like, you know, because even creating enough fundraising action, it's not really going to uh, be super successful if you don't know how to do it. So the more good you are, you are at it, the more kind of you will help the community. So based on this goal, we kind of created our levels, which is like uh, those abstractions, which is like the first one is like acquisition, which we do have customers coming to our platform from different sources. So we kind of aggregate them together and create this one metric which is basically like uh, how many people are coming to our platform and from which source. We also have conversion, which is like uh, basic uh, how people are interacting with the platform, and how many of those people will actually uh, are actually doing the first step to start using our product. We also have activation, which is like a metric to measure 
uh, how many of those people are more active, how many of those people have moved past the first stage and started actually working with our product and started to actually interact with our product and community. And you also have page value, which is like an aggregation of number of donations, number of pages, and, uh, and all the different statistics related to money. So those, those are the basic phasing levels we have started with, and they are very close to how you mostly perceive B2C products. But we have like a, instead of thinking about them like, okay, we have some acquisition, we put behind them our own uh, equ equations, which were based on our data, and we're kind of, we are kind of uh, semi-automatically calculating them. So those are our basic levels. And based on those levels, kind of envision our strategy. So we use those levels to kind of find out what, what, what we want to do and where we want to go and how we want to do it. So as, a, as an example here, uh, we have like a, this like a, a flow of uh, things influencing other things. So like acquisition is influenced conversion, conversion is influenced acti activation, and activation is conversion where all of them are kind of influencing page value. And they are kind of connected together. And if we like assume that our base value right now is like 2 million acquisition, 40% conversion, 30% activation, and page value 100 pounds, this is like our baseline, the place we start. Then we can envision our strategy. And using level manipulation, if we have like a, our baseline here, and we have our goal here, that's the place we want to go, we can kind of start manipulating those levels to reach our goal. And then we can kind of calculate that, okay, let's assume that moving this level to the point of 2.5 million, we'll get closer to the goal a bit. Let's say that also increasing conversion will get us closer to the goal. And the same thing with activation, if we increase it a bit, we'll get closer to the goal. So this is like kind of how we envision strategy in engineering and in product. And then we build a strategy. So we kind of uh, try to find out different ways on how to reach the goal. Like, like different ways, like how can we manipulate those levels to reach here, right? So we kind of try to find a different ways to, to do this. And we can have like, okay, we we'll increase acquisition, we we'll increase conversion, we'll kind of drop with activation, we don't really want to bother about it. But we will maintain the, the same page value because we can kind of do this and it's really not that uh, important. All the different strategy, maybe this one kind of feels okay, but let's think about different strategies. So we can drop the acquisition, we can improve conversion, improve activation, and say, kind of maintain the page value. Based on those, we kind of pick one of those, and then we do brainstorming. So we look uh, for different ideas and different things that we would like to add to the platform. So we look at the competition, we look at the user feedback, what kind of problems do, does, the, does, does the user have? what kind of trends are in the market, and also like some other crazy ideas you would like to use or to kind of add to our product. After brainstorming, we do our prioritization. So we, for both of those strategies, we kind of try to uh, think about what kind of different features will kind of, what kind of uh, metric, what kind of level they will influence. So like for instance here, feature one will influence acquisition and will, will influence the conversion kind of in a big way. Feature 3 won't do anything. Feature 2 will kind of increase activation a bit. And feature 4 will kind of increase activation even more. And feature 5 will increase page value right now in some, some, some way. But because we are picking some strategy, we are then deciding, okay, feature 2 is kind of not increasing activation that much, so we're going to just remove it because feature 4 is better. Feature 3 is not doing anything that kind of is related to our metrics, so why it's bother? Why are you doing it? And feature 5 is like, we don't care about page value, so why we should really do feature 5 at all. So based on that prioritization, we kind of end up with two features, which is like feature 1 and feature 4 here. Then of course we kind of implement those, we do some engineering stuff, we do release it to production, and then we measure it. So this is like a really important step. We measure it, we use A-B test, and we measure its impact on the levels. So we try to find out if doing those features kind of moved the levels in a correct way, the way we predicted. And the, it can be like positive or it can be negative. And the, the most important step in here is that after the me this measurement and this kind of research on how everything was affected, we kind of learn and adapt from it. So this is like kind of very, very important because based on that, we maybe we should completely remove <coughs> the feature at all because if feature is not giving us anything, it's really not good to have a product that is feature bloated, so it's really important to remove stuff that is not even doing anything. 
or maybe you should pick up different strategies. So like instead of uh, moving conversion, maybe we should move acquisition <coughs> a bit more. So yeah, so this is like maybe we should do a different strategy. Maybe we should think up different levels. Maybe our basic uh, initial uh, way of thinking about it was completely incorrect, and maybe our levels are not really doing anything substantial, or maybe are not really moving our product in a, in a correct way. So just to reiterate on the whole process, we kind of start with a mission, then we kind of create a goal out of it, and based on goal, we create lever. Based on levels, we create strategy. Based on strategy, we kind of brainstorm and prioritize the idea. And then we, of course, implement, we measure everything, and then we adapt, and then we have like a loop in here, which is basically data-driven development process. And this is basically how we kind of write our words, and how this, and we've seen that this process is really nice, and it kind of works in, in one of our products. So we are kind of moving this, this process to different teams, and we'll see how, how it goes. Okay, everyone did the photo? Good. Okay. So, this is basically the whole process, which is based like a, uh, so those levels, based on goal, which is kind of like data should be kind of in here, and this data is like getting in here, and it's like influencing the way the levels cooperate, and based on those levels, you kind of do everything else here. And what we found, is that this process kind of is really good because it, it increases understanding in the whole team and everyone in the team. And like me, I, I have an engineering background, so I was mostly engineer, I was coding stuff, and most of the time when a product owner came to me, it was mostly like, okay, just do this stuff and just do this feature and that's fine, right? I was like mostly responsible for execution. And most of the business decisions around the product were kind of foggy and I kind of didn't understand them. But with levers and the way we kind of uh, explain how the products work and how the product development works, that this feature will increase acquisition. Okay, so an acquisition is doing this and that. This increases kind of like a clarity in the whole team, and especially to people like me, engineers. So when I'm doing a feature, I actually understand like why we are doing it, what what is our goal, what is our strategy, and where we, where we, where we are heading with it, and what kind of number do we want to achieve. The other thing that we found out is also that organizing team around levels, around data, have kind of helped us with team alignment. So you kind of know that like, most of the teams work in a way that after time some of the people will kind of drift apart and you have to bring them back to the common goal because it's kind of normal process that people are getting out of the like of this the same road and kind of go somewhere else. So we found out that using those levels, those abstractions and those discussions and some other practices I'm gonna show later, it kind of helps us to bring people back to the similar goal, to the similar mission that we have in our, in our company, in our product. Yeah, so we are bringing the team closer to the goal. And we are kind of reinforcing the whole process by some team practices. So it's not only like this data driven development, which is basically about how to explain which features we do and how do we pick features and how, we, how do we think about product development. We also have some, th some team practices that are kind of reinforcing everything. So we have like a m weekly metric stand-up, which is like after our daily usual <coughs> stand-up, we also have like a stand-up with uh, some business analysts showing out all the metrics, all the levels, how they change, how they increase with time. Did we actually did something that moved them? Did we actually did something that kind of move them uh, to the play that we don't want to do. So we every week have a whole team, like for everyone, engineers, web designers, CS, everyone is kind of included and they know what is happening in the product. The other thing is that we will be sharing learnings and levels with other teams. So maybe other teams, different teams with slightly different products, maybe they will have they, maybe they will find out different abstractions that could be good for us. So we will be like kind of, kind of sharing it between the different product in the business units. And we also have public metrics, it's like uh, on our monitors you can see how our metrics are changing, what is happening, and you can come, cl come over to my desk and ask about something. <coughs> and this also is like a nice catalysator or like a nice thing to influence the conversation and influence the communication in the teams and, and the whole company. And all of this, uh, this data-driven uh, process, or sorry, the data-driven process and this kind of reinforced loop and all of those practices, this, they kind of created a collective intelligence in our teams, which is kind of important because like I showed, collective intelligence is really a good way to 
made the whole team working together. And in order to create collective intelligence, you have to have people in the same goal, in the same mission, in the same road. And with the whole process kind of incre increases the understanding in the whole team. So everyone can be involved in the product development process. Of course, we have people with bigger speciality that can have like a, you know more saying in it. But it doesn't mean that I can't kind of talk with my product uh, manager or my product uh, owner about the things we are building. So it doesn't mean that me, engineer, I don't understand any, everything. I mean, I don't understand anything. I kind of understand what is happening, how it's happening and where we are going. So I can kind of start interesting discussions and interesting conversation with everyone in the team. Yeah, there were some challenges with this process. It's like, it's not cheap because you have to get the data from somewhere, but it doesn't mean that you have to create this big big data solution because you can use uh, really uh, different metrics from different kind of products and kind of, if you are, the important thing is to find a good abstraction. So you, whatever data you have, if you find a good abstraction that is closer to your mission and it's gonna make your product better, uh, then if you get the metrics from somewhere, it doesn't really matter from where you get the metric. You can use really a simple product uh, that will, a cheap product that will give you that. So you don't have to create this whole big data solution with all the different data scientists doing stuff and, you know, a, a lot of data being gathered. You can really rely on small data solution. And it, it requires some investment because, like, well, there will be some time that will need, that you will need to spend to teach this stuff and get everyone on board and some people will revolve or won't like it, so it's really, it's really an investment. And data integrity is really critical, this is something that is really painful to us right now, because if you base your decisions on like metrics that are driven by data, if your data integrity is not perfect and your data is kind of broken, you will do kind of not good decisions. We found out some issues in our data, current data solution, some, like some events were missing and it's really important to monitor the data, monitor how, how the metrics are behaving. Uh, we are currently working on a solution that will show us that, for instance, one of the metrics is changing too rapidly. So it might be a good sign that, okay, uh, actually the market is responding pretty well to our features, but it might be also a sign that maybe something is broken in our, in our product, in our data uh, collecting system. And if, that, if you pick up bad abstractions, you will kind of not go to the correct way. So it's really important to pick good abstractions for the end, uh, yeah. Okay, in a summary. So, we use data, and based on data we create abstractions, and those abstractions are levels. So this is how we extract, this is how we think about data. And we are not scared about data. So, like me, engineer, I don't have to know kind of what are the equations really behind these things. I kind of rely on the level and I kind of rely on the description of the lever. <coughs> so there is like a business analyst that takes the data and kind of creates this abstraction. So I'm not afraid of lo really looking at this at all. And all the people in the product are also not afraid of it. And we have kind of like a data-centric process, which is like data is kind of hidden, abstracted, but it's still influencing our process and our product development. Any questions? So, so this data is, is based to, is, we use data to create this abstraction, which is like a nice way to describe like a different metrics together. And then this abstraction is basically used to drive the idea we kind of do. Because the idea I like to show was like a feature. And we, if we have idea, the idea will create a feature. And then this feature we kind of try to uh, think about what kind of abstraction it will influence and then we decide if we want to do this feature or not. So data, in the end, is kind of driving which feature we do. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use external data, uh, which is completely related to the business? So, for example, if you could probably hypothesize that if there's a natural disaster, people might be more giving back <coughs> the time and then account for how that might impact their usage on your platform. So we still, have, we still don't have solutions for that to how to automate it, mm -hmm. but because of we just giving, we've been here for like 10 plus years, we kind of, based on our own intuition and experience, we know that this is something we, we, have, we will have to look at. But this is more difficult to do because we will have to kind of scan the environment, which is kind of out of our control in a way. Or maybe we could use like a, if we build a community that will help us to fetch in, fetch in the data, we could have like a response time which would be really, really small. 
but we will still need some people to kind of monitor the situation around the world and kind of give us the feedback of what is happening. So maybe the building community solution might be a good thing to kind of create like a natural people based, uh, social based system to get us get us the data. But right now we don't have something like that yet. Sure. Uh, so, I don't know exactly the full, full details, so the, all those levels were kind of created by business analysts and they kind of explained it to, to us, uh, but mostly it's based on, uh, you, if you have like a lot of data, you kind of try to find out the connection between them and how they influence the, 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 the product. So if you take like a number of shares uh, or different kind of ways people are sharing, you can kind of think, of, you can kind of think about in, intuitively that, okay, this might lead to better virality and then you create those equations that kind of will will kind of uh, integrate the data together but those those equations you can they still need to be optimized so you kind of create first uh, equation and see what is happening and then you have to you know change those variables somehow yeah, yeah so it's like a long running problem you could use some machine learning in there but right now we don't do stuff like that we kind of do it still manually with business analysts that are embedded into the team yeah. Um, you're very fortunate to have a huge data set yeah. to work with. I mean, not everyone has that. Yeah. Um, if that was taken away, how would you do what you do? How would you prioritize, or how would your product owner prioritize, do you think? Um, like new companies, new models, yeah. where do so, you start? I mean, I've been to talks with Etsy, you have millions of users, similar, exactly the same situation. So big data is a fortunate situation because our feedback loop is really small and our statistical significance, we can really reach it very fast. With smaller data, you would have to spend much more time to really collect like a, a sample of data that will really tell you that, okay, something is happening. Because the bigger sample, the bigger chance you will find something in there. So for smaller solutions, uh, this is a really, really tricky question. Uh, I'm not sure how to respond to that. I can. I still believe that even if you kind of use something like Google Analytics to kind of give you some metrics, I still believe that you could find something in there. It will be much more difficult if you have smaller data data snapshot. But I think like it's with bigger data, it's just easier to find find those connections. With smaller data, it's much more difficult to find those connections. But I still believe it's possible. With bigger data, it's better, but it's like more expensive. So, I, so this is like the biggest problem right now. This is why the data scientists are really, really, really needed everywhere, and a lot of people are going into data science uh, place because a lot of companies need those people that will create those connections. We kind of create, we'll find out like uh, what kind of data is basically influencing what, and maybe in the future we will have some solution to find better answer with smaller data samples. But I, I don't think you need a huge data set in order to define your lead. Right. So, um, but if you want to create good levers that are really correlated to your product and where you want to go, you s with smaller data sample, you would just need more time to kind of find out if those are good levers or not. With bigger data sample, you get more data and you can much more easily find out if those levers are really good or not. Uh, so, with smaller data sample, I think it's it's still possible, but it just takes more time. And maybe it's, it's proving whether it was successful. I think you can you can say that we know our levers are virality, conversion, um, activation, but it's how you know that the work you've done has actually paid off in the way that you thought. It would. And I think that's right. it comes down to not having the, the big data sets problem. So then, then I think that the feedback loop, feedback loop will just take more time. So with bigger data, it's going to be like a matter of days when you find out that there is an impact. With smaller data, you just need to take more time really to get bigger data sample, to really get into the conclusion that, okay, something has happened and we have influence to that. Because if you take like a small data sample, you can have the smaller data sample, the bigger error uh, factor there is. So I think the big data is really helping with in here with a uh, problem that the error is really, really getting smaller if you have more data. Yeah, but with, with small data, I still believe that it will be possible. It would just take more, much more time to do it. There was someone else uh, also with question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, domain-driven design. Uh, in that scenario, to be agile, you basically have the different domains manage or curate their own data. Yes. So what kind of? We still have one big. Uh, okay, so you still create a big data lake and throw yeah. everything in there. 
still have one big hardware solution uh, that basically holds the data, but we have, uh, we, ca we are not using DDD per se completely, but we kind of uh, took some of the concepts of the domain driven design as bounded <coughs> context, and we kind of tried to organize the teams and technical people around bounded context uh, by themselves. Create like a one team that collaborates together in this context, and that's all. This person from this team doesn't work in like a different context. But, so we still hold the data in one big solution, but the way how we use the data and the way how we read the data, it's based on the one context. Do, do you call it a data lake or do you call it a data warehouse? Actually, how do you call it? Yeah, I mean, the analytics platform. Yeah. <laughs> for, me, for me, it's just like, you know, some place I just go in there and I just query for the data and that's all, that's all I get. Yeah, I think we, we have like um, one place where we store all the data, but then we, in this case it's S3, and then we kind of export it into different kind of. We, you could call one of our solutions data lakes, we have a warehouse, and, but overall, I think, you know, the main storage is. So, how do you keep all the da different data sets in sync? If someone yeah. made, modifies the core data, how is it propagated to make sure that it's. Oh, we, we, don't, store, we, do, we don't store snapshots. We don't store oh. snapshots. We always query the original source. So we don't have to kind of think it. But uh, if we have, uh, if we create some, some metric or a report analysis, which is historical, it will be really difficult to, if we change down the data that it was based in the past, it's, we, have, we will have to recalculate the report, which, will, which, which would, could be difficult, kind of. But I don't know, I don't know the full details in that. I know that sometimes when you have error in our platform and we spot the error after three months, uh, our business analysts are really angry and they are not happy about yeah. it. See, what, one of the problems is that you have data analysts in yeah. each of the domain. Yeah. They will create an abstraction. Then there is possibility that two analysts will create two different abstractions, but the underlying data is exactly the same. That's why we kind of want to have like a platform of sharing and together learning on what we do and how we do it to find out problems like that. Because, yeah, it's good to name even in two different contexts, if we have the same abstraction, it's good to learn it the same way because then the communication between the different contexts and different teams will be better. But yeah, but that, that might be a problem. But that's why we kind of try to share this outside my context and other contexts. So hopefully this will solve this problem, but I'm not. Definitely there will be problems too. There, too. there was someone else. Yeah? So yeah, just going back to the smooth where you are doing the data to the Well, I think that I think that interesting. You can still influence it because if you explain uh, from the core of why we are doing it and how it's driving us and how, why where is our motivation, I think that you will convince most of the developers to this idea. If they do understand why we are doing it and uh, how it's going to influence the product and that this this is really important, I this should in, this should influence everyone. However, yes, there will be some people that might not buy it completely. But then, uh, I'm not sure if we don't have, I think we didn't have a problem like that, but it mostly comes probably to hiring and the culture we have. So we try to hire people that are really kind of, do have engineering background, but also want to be involved in product development. So we don't kind of, we don't, we try to avoid people that would love to only do hardware engineering and, you know, low level engineering and that's all. No, we want people that are, want to know and want to understand the business and why they're doing stuff. But in that kind of situation, we still have, we still maintaining, uh, we still use 10% of our time in every product to kind of do technical roadmap because not everything, not stability, it's, stability is difficult to measure what kind of levers is going to influence because it's going to influence everything. If the platform is not stable, the, all the levers will be influenced. So we kind of have stability in our, something I call technical roadmap. And it's kind of a bit similar to product roadmap. We also kind of use, uh, our own levels in our technical way, but we have kind of our own roadmap. And maybe then, if some developers are revolting, they could do some stuff related with this, with this stability uh, or technical roadmap, which is like they feel it's, um, it's their own. But still, I'm just giving you kind of try to hire people that do want to be involved in business.
just, I'm just going to allow one more question and then oh, we, so we, yes, it's fine, just overrun a bit on the Q&A. Um, you talked about your tools earlier that you used to kind of gather this data. One of them was Hotjar. Yeah. I've just ripped Hotjar out because it, was, it added so much page weight. There was an enormous cost to yeah. having this. Yeah, and, and it's like, a bit analytical even. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a whole... <laughs> how, how do you decide what to use or not to use? So mostly we use A-B tests, and mostly we do use other levels to, to measure how people are interacting. But from time to time, uh, we do use Hotjar to kind of see like exactly what is so the behavior. So feature toggling it, perhaps? We are feature toggling, yeah. Fine. It's not running all the time. No, no, Fine. we're only turning it. But to, to be honest, we ran it the last time. We kind of ran it maybe a couple of months ago. Yeah. It's only run on demand. If we really don't know what is happening, and we kind of don't, we are not able to find out what is happening on our platform based on our events and the data we are generating in a, in a platform, we kind of use Hotjar to kind of get into the core and to kind of observe how people are interacting with the platform. Because this is like the full source of truth. But then still you, have, you need more people and you have to spend a lot of time watching those Hotjar videos and then it's really, you can't automate this work because this is mostly like a video playing and you can see the mouse movement and things like that. It's not really perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, thank, thank you very you. much.